So now you want to find a job, but you're wondering how. In this week's episode of Real Life Success, I'm going to show you how to dominate your career. I'm going to show you what to do, not only to get in the job, but what to do once you're on the job, and then even the next step after that. So tune in. You're now watching Real Life Success. Let's talk about everything that you need from start to finish. Let's first talk about getting the job, right? Because in this week's episode, we're not only going to talk about getting the job, we're going to talk about what to do once you're on the job and then thoughts after the job. Because like I said, I worked for six years in corporate America, but then after that, I started up my own business. But for many of us, including myself, this might be a stepping stone to a larger dream and a larger purpose. I'm going to show you all of the steps. So step one, getting the job, right? So in order for you to get the job, one thing you have to understand is there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that want the exact same position that you want. So it's all about standing out, right? There's too many people that's comfortable with submitting the same elevator pitch, the same resume, making the same gimmicks about what they can do for the company, the same words. And guess what? You have to stand out from the crowd. How do you stand out from the crowd? First and foremost, with your skills, right? So all of the things considered equal, skills is what's going to have you stand out, right? Imagine if you are submitting a resume and somebody else in the pile of resumes has the exact same credentials. Maybe you went to the same school. Maybe you have the same resume paper. You guys are more or less the same. Whoever has the best skills in many cases will win. That's the reason why you want to focus on making sure that your skills are up to par. You know, if you have a technology job, you need to make sure that you have the most modern skills. You need to know the latest software. Maybe it's the latest programming language. You know, education isn't enough, even though that's important to have on the job, because in many cases, you know, for a lot of jobs like corporate jobs, a college degree is required. But the number one most important thing is skills, skills, education. And don't just think that education means here college. It could be college. It could be certifications. It can be programs. Etc. Again, one of the things that I would really think about is what is the average person turning in when they're applying to this job. So, for example, if the average person has a college degree, what makes you stand out? Okay, we take the college out of the picture. Does everybody have a certification? Has everybody went through special programs? See, you need to have a list written out of all of the things that you expect the average candidate to have and how you can blow past them. That's one thing that I would advise. Right. And when you're going back to the skills, what's the average skill that the person had? Maybe what is the average number of years that the candidate might have worked to be able to get this job? You want to have a competitive advantage. OK, so in order for you to get the job, you need skills, you need education, but then you also need presentation. Now, this arguably is the number one most important factor in the resume piece or getting the job portion, right? Because the skills are the most important to be able to get you the job in terms of actually keeping the job. But a lot of times you would be surprised that when it comes to a person's resume or getting the job, it's not always the most skilled person that actually gets the position. The most skilled per person is worthy of the position, but oftentimes it's about who can have the best presentation because he who has the best presentation wins, 
right? A lot of times when it comes to resumes, right? The average resume is only reviewed for 30 seconds max. That's the reason why all of your resumes should be one page. But when it comes to your presentation, if someone only has 30 seconds top to review the average resume or less, obviously in that case, maybe the reviewer or the recruiter is not looking deeply at all of the skills that's going into the candidate. A lot of times, the number one person that stands out is who has the best presentation. Now, here are ways to improve the presentation. And if you haven't signed up for my VIP video vault at this point, you want to do so because I'm going to go into more videos on how to dominate your career. When you're wanting to improve your presentation, one of the first things that you need to do is you need to make sure, obviously, that you have things like grammar, good resume paper, but then there's so much more than that, right? You might be feeling like, okay, that's kind of elementary. When you're making a good presentation, a good resume is one that's custom made for the position that you're going for, right? So you want to also have customized resume in place, right? The last thing that you want to do is go into an interview or go to a job fair handing someone a resume and they ask you, what can you tell me about this company? And you say, I don't know. I just want a job. That's horrible presentation, right? But imagine if you were someone, you had good skills written down, you had the right level of education, and you knew this company like the back of your hand. Would that not impress the recruiter? Would that not give you an extra edge over the competition? Of course it would. What if on your resume, maybe in your objective statement or maybe in your summary statement, you had something about the position you were applying for in the objective or summary statement? Now, wouldn't that stand out beyond the random person that says, I'm seeking a position at the company so I can make a lot of money? I'm seeking a position at the company so I can have a good nine to five job. See, everybody puts those things in. But the number one way to get the job properly is to make sure that you have above average skills, above average education, above average presentation, right? And the accumulation of these things really aren't that hard. See, you don't have to just go to school to get skills. Remember, you can always intern to get skills. You can always take on mentors. I got to keep harping on this. You can get skills quickly added to your repertoire if you have mentors in place that will give you an edge over everybody that doesn't have mentors. Imagine if you were applying for an IT position, right? And there is one person that's coming out of college that's never worked at an IT company before, that doesn't know anybody that works at an IT company, and then here you come. Maybe your father was in the IT field. Maybe your brother was in the IT field. Wouldn't that give you somewhat of a competitive advantage if they were your mentor? That's one of the reasons why networking is so important, because through networking, you can have insider secrets in that company on the best skills to have. So I'll give you another prime example. Let's say that you were applying for a company and it says one thing on the application. They might say very generic, you know, four years of college recommended. This is required. This is required. But then you know someone that works at the company and then you can ask them through the power of networking you know, hey, you know, I'm really interested in this position and I think I'd be a really great fit. What is the employer really looking for in this position? Now, one of the best ways to work through networking here is by using LinkedIn. Because, you know, one of the things that I really liked about LinkedIn is a lot of times you never realize who in your network works at which company because you fall out of touch with people. It's hard to keep up. Right. So maybe you want a job at Google. And then as you're looking at the Google application, 
Maybe you forgot that somebody that you went to college with now works at Google. Wouldn't it give you an advantage if you reached out to that person and said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about applying for this position. I want to be in this company. You know, what can you tell me about working at Google? What's life like? You know, what are some of the challenges that are going on at Google? What are some of the things that, you know, a lot of employers are looking at that said, wow, you know what? We have a really good team, but I really need somebody that has X skill. And then you get down that skill. Would that make you more competitive than the average person that's coming with average skills? Of course it would. What if you were in this area of education where maybe you have a college degree, but you were in a special course strictly for Google employees, right? What if you were in a special program that was centered around the newest innovative programs that was going on at Google, the newest initiatives? Would that not give you a leg up? And then in presentation, man, wouldn't it be good if you walked up to a Google boss and you said, hey, my name is such and such. I just recently went through the newest course on how to be a top candidate at Google. And based upon this skill set, I think I'd be excellent for your position. Of course, that's going to help you stand out from the crowd. And there are so many more tactics. But I assure you, if you don't have these three down to a science you're not going to get the position because there's too many people applying for it, right? So along with the presentation, there's so many communication pieces that goes into it, right? So you have the pre-work, right? There, there's work that goes into building a good presentation before you even get to the job fair, before you turn in the resume, right? Before you submit the application, there's pre-work. Then you also have on the job presentation. So here's what I mean when I say on the job presentation. When you meet someone that has the opportunity to give you a job, you need to be very keen about what they're saying to you because a lot of the information that they're giving you right then in that moment is going to be a big golden key to be able to help you when you're giving a follow-up, right? What's going to separate a person that just comes, drops in their resume, and never reaches out to their employer again versus the person that has done the pre-work, they meet their candidate, they meet the employer at the job fair, they're listening to what the employer says about how to be a top pick for the company, and then they do the follow-up based upon the on-the-job presentation. See, this is how you make sure that you're maximizing your presentation skills. Because what do most people do? Most people don't put in the adequate pre-work. For example, they're giving a generic resume improper spelling, poor resume paper. It's regular computer paper rather than resume paper. There's a difference. They haven't really done the pre-work. Then they get to the job fair and the person asks them, why do you want to work for this company? The person doesn't have good answers because they didn't focus on it in pre-work. They're not focusing on what the employer is telling them about how to really, you know, be an A performer at the job. And because of the fact that they didn't focus on the pre-work or the on-the-job presentation, they're never going to do the follow-up because they don't even have enough material to engage in the conversation. See, when you are applying for a job, everything builds on each other, right? If you don't have the right skills, you're going to be lacking in confidence in your presentation. If you don't have the right education, you're not going to be able to get the foot in the door when it comes to going for certain positions because there's so many barriers to entry. So I want you to think real hard about this list and think about, is there any area where I may be lacking? Or again, like I said, just as a simple exercise, take out a sheet of paper and write down in terms of averages, what is the average skill level of the person that's competing with me for this job? What is the average education level? What is the average presentation that they're going to come with? 
And then you brainstorm a series of creative ways on how to have better skills, better education, better presentation. And you're going to find there's a lot of easy solutions to put in place. That's what's going to help you stand out. Now, before I talk about you actually getting on the job, here's a couple of things that I want to say about this in closing. One of the worst regrets that I have professionally is that I did not negotiate for a first position. You know, here's one thing that I want you to think of, right? In your career and in your salary, right? When it comes to your salary, if you're doing things the right way, your salary should always gradually incline, right? But how high and how far up you go depends on where you started from, right? So in other words, if you negotiated, maybe if you didn't negotiate, you would be at this bottom level. But wouldn't it be so much nicer if you maybe started from here instead of here? If you started from here, guess what? Maybe this is not going to be your curve up. Maybe this is going to be your curve up. See, whenever you start from a higher position, it's going to boost your morale. You're going to be more motivated. You're going to have more uh, meaning in the company, right? You're going to have greater satisfaction. And I mean, just overall, you're going to have more reason to achieve. And this has already been proven through statistics and research. One of the main things that I wish that I would have done is that I would have negotiated for my very first opportunity. I learned it the hard way and started negotiating every time after that. But again, remember, you know, and all things considered equal, if one person takes a job starting off at $10,000 less than somebody else, and they're taking the same job, do you not know that over the course of 15 to 20 years of, of a career, by the time both of them are already at that 20-year mark, they could have a tens of thousands of dollars difference in salary just based upon where they started here, right? Because it's all a cycle. You want to start off in your career as far ahead as you can. That's why you have to know your own worth. What's going to drive your worth? How much skill you have, because your skill is going to determine your value. How much education you have, because in oftentimes, we know how it is in the system. It's hard to get your foot in the door if you don't have the right credentials. And then again, your presentation, because he who has the best presentation wins. I can guarantee you that. I've seen thousands of resumes in my time as a college recruiter. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, in many of those cases where I conducted interviews, in many of the cases where I was looking at people's resumes, I probably didn't know it any better, but there were people that probably had a vast array of skills, more proficient on the job than the person who sometimes got the job. But because the person was in a better position to present their argument on why they would be a good candidate, they got the job. Maybe they had satisfactory grades. Maybe they had satisfactory resume, but it was their presentation that put them over the hill. So likewise, same with you. Once you get the job, don't forget to negotiate. All right. You're welcome for that. Now, when it comes to the subject of being on the job, right? So it's not over yet because remember, this is about dominating your career. So when you are on the job, here's some of the things that you want to focus on. You want to be able to always see the expectations. Then document them. Don't just exceed the expectations and then forget about it. Because trust me, your boss is probably going to forget about it if he's not a good boss. Your directors are not going to acknowledge it if you don't have it written down. Remember, a lot of times people don't know what you've accomplished unless you self-promote. That's the reason why anytime you get to an employee evaluation, 
You always want to come with a documented list of your own personal achievements throughout the year. You always want to talk about how much money you made the company. You always want to talk about how much you saved the company. You always want to talk about how much you made improvements in the operations of the company. Document it, document it, document it. I cannot stress this enough. There are scores and scores and scores of people who have worked themselves into the ground that have never gotten the proper recognition from their managers or their managers because of this very reason. You want to make sure that you go above and beyond in the position because you don't want to just stay stuck in the same position all your life, right? You want to move up maybe the corporate ladder. Maybe you want some type of upward mobility. This is why documentation is so critical. I've been in situations where you've had excellent workers, naturally excellent workers. They loved their job. They were naturally great at it, but they got beat out for positions by people who were half as good, but they were able to speak to what they did for the company. Because guess what? Unfortunately, especially in a large company, a lot of times nobody's watching. And people need reminders of what you've done throughout the year. So you always want to make sure you have things documented. When you are on the job, always make sure that you're exceeding expectations. Always be mindful of the fact that, you know, no matter what you've been asked to do in the job, right? The basis of having a job is maximizing value for the company. You making the company much more money than they're making you, right? So... In order to exceed the expectations, one of the things that you always want to do is you want to maximize training on the job. Maximize your training on the job, right? Here's something that I want to tell a lot of you, especially that are getting out of college. All of the learning that you got in college, a lot of it you're not going to do on your job. Most of the learning that's going to take place that's actually going to be applied in the job is going to come from on-the-job training. So as soon as you get in this position, even if you can get an advantage and a head start, learn about the things that you're going to do on the job and maximize the training in it. Because remember, if you are somebody that's really skilled in the position, you're always going to be well-paid. You want to be skilled on such a level where your skills are indispensable. That's one thing that you always have to ask yourself. Do you pass the indispensable test? And that's becoming harder and harder and harder now in a world where there's so many positions that can be automated. There's so many positions where a computer can take over your role. Ask yourself, as you're getting into a position, am I aligning myself to be so good I can't get fired or it would be extremely hard to fire me. Or maybe they would have to pay somebody three times as much to be able to do the same job as you. Maximize your training on the job. Also, one of the things that you always want to do is you want to have candid conversations with your boss. Right. So you want to have um, communication because communication is key. So. You know, a lot of times in companies, what they do is they have regular one-on-ones. Don't be the person that goes to the one-on-one where when you're communicating with your boss, you're like, oh, yeah, everything is good. All right, see you later. That's going to ensure that you don't really grow from that position. One of the things that you always want to do, and this is even before you get the job, this could even be at the interview portion, you always want to ask your boss questions because by asking your boss questions, it does two things. One, it gives you all of the information that you need to maximize your performance on the job versus somebody that doesn't have that. Everybody else has generic information. And two, guess what else? It lets them know that you are interested. So if you're sitting in a one-on-one or you're just sitting in an interview and you know, you're just kind of monotonous about things, you're just answering the questions as it's given to you, guess what? Again, everybody is doing that. Remember? This is all about standing out. Now, is everybody going to the interview and asking the boss questions? No, wouldn't even think to do it. 
Is everybody going to their one-on-one with their boss and asking their boss questions? You know, hey, what are some of your best practices? What are some of the things that you regret in your own professional career? What are some of the best trainings that you've taken on? What are some of the best books that you've read? You know, maybe what are my top strengths? What are my top weaknesses? What should I do more of? What should I do less of? By you actually asking your boss these questions in a one-on-one, you'll be surprised how far you can go. Because, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to working in any type of job setting or even corporate setting, people at the end of the day, even though still sometimes jerks, they're still human, right? So they are able to discern, okay, who wants to position more? Who's really working hard? Even if the skill isn't there, the effort is always displayed. So if you can display that you're always willing to go the extra mile, you can display that you're always inquisitive, you can display that you're always learning, and you have all of these things documented, trust me, you're going to shoot up the ladder. And then one of the reasons why documenting is so important is because it's always going to be a bargaining chip on why you should make more and more and more and more. So here's what I do again. When it comes time to the employee evaluation, guess what? You're always going to have a baseline on what the average employee is making throughout the industry from the skills that you have. So say, let's say, for example, you feel like you're underpaid uh, in your position. Every single year before you go to an employee evaluation, look at what the average person is making. Even when you go to a a job interview and maybe you're at the point of negotiation, you should always be aware of what the average person is making in this position. Because with the right documentation, you can always prove that you deserve more than the average person because you're not the average person. You've gone above and beyond, right? So this is just a little bit of information about on-the-job training. Now, going beyond the job now, what does that look like? Beyond the job. So if you find yourself in a position like I did, you're going to want to stay in communication with people that move on from the company that you once worked for, right? So when I worked in corporate America... Long before I made my exit, I stayed in communication with the people that already left. And I wanted to get the feedback on, one, why they left, and two, I wanted to understand what the perks look like in the other companies that they were working for. See, because right now, we're in an economy where in a lot of jobs, most people will stay there two or three years, then jump, two or three years, then jump. You know, the day of, you know, working at the same company 20, 30 years, it's almost non-existent, right? You, these same companies are not giving out pensions and all of these other things. It's a different world now from your parents' generation and their parents' generation. Now everybody is bouncing around to survive. So you want to find out when it comes to the people that was in your network amongst your coworkers Find out why they left. Find out really how much greener the grass is on the other side, right? Um, So you want to find out, is the grass greener? So we'll call this the grass greener effect, right? Is the grass really greener on the other side? Now, if you have developed good networking, like I've been telling you, and a good rapport with your coworkers because you never know when they're going to be able to help you. When they find another job at a better position, guess what they're going to do? They're going to refer you to their employees. They're going to give you the secrets on how to continue to climb up the ladder. Even in your nine to five job, you should always be looking for a network of people to be in your circle of influence, to be your set of advisors, to become a set of your mentors. See, even if you maybe don't want to stay in corporate America all of your life, in the time that you are there, you have to know how to play the game. And then you also have to know how to have an exit plan in place, right? There's too many people who just up and say, oh, I'm going to quit. 
Oh, I want to be gone. Oh, I'm about to get fired and just not do anything. Don't do that. Create an exit plan. What would I create? I would create an exit plan of roughly about 18 months. Give yourself about 18 months time, you know, a couple years. Give yourself a couple years to outline where you are now versus where you want to be and then actually putting in the work to get from step A to step B, to get from one point to the next point, right? The whole time where you're setting up the exit plan, you're working with mentors in and out of the job. You're finding out if the grass is greener. You're finding out why they left. You're networking on LinkedIn to see, is my next move going to be a better move? Have your exit plan in place because if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. All right? So there's really so much more that I could touch on, but I want you to let me know, you know, what did you take away from this video? What do you think is probably one of your core challenges? Is one of your core challenges just getting the job? Is it hard for you to get your foot in the door at certain places? And if so, why? What's holding you up? Is it your resume? Is it your lack of skills? Is it maybe a lack of education? And what are you going to do to improve on that? Uh, I want you to let me know, you know, where are you kind of finding yourself at a dead end on? If possible, send me your feedback and I'll do my best to help you out. Okay? So, as always, don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you on the next episode of Real Life Success.